I think, since 2008, capitalism is once again haunting, as in the first line of the Communist Manifesto, a spectre is haunting Europe. Um, capitalism is haunted by the possibility of a different mode of production. And to me, this is what makes Marx... Marx is incredibly relevant to us historically, but I think Marx is also relevant to us now because capitalism is once again haunted by the fear of and the possibility of a non-capitalist world. My thinking came from a very classic form of Marxism in the early 1980s, which was in, because Britain, Marxism was Trotskyism, I was a Trotskyist, a kind of Gramscian Trotskyist nevertheless. But I believed and saw all around me, the proletariat, the proletarian community, the very strongly hierarchical miners uh, or union that my grandfather and father had been in. I be, it, it, that theory fitted that world, but the modern world, of the heterogeneous, networked, highly individualistic person, I think needs a different form of an understanding of where the struggle is. So my um, attitude to Marx and Marxism is to use it as a toolbox. Now, a classic and orthodox Marxist would say this is no good. Marxism is one big machine. You can't take parts of it out. I think I would like to try uh, the first and most important part of Marxism that I think um, it underpins all objective thinking about society is the concept of the mode of production. Marx allows us to understand history as a series of systems that follow each other and the general rule once we analyse society in that way, is that the seeds of the next system can be found within the old system, but they are often hidden. They, are often, they often look like an informal or a criminal or a subcultural economy. Wikipedia, free software, cooperatives, peer-to-peer -peer lenders, platform cooperatives, so when people form an alternative to Uber and run the system of buying and selling themselves, independent of a monopoly company, um, the contribution in our free time to uh, projects using network technology that are never designed to make money or to benefit us financially. These are the seeds of a future society based on abundance. The new struggle is how do, we, how do we use networks? Marx imagines this in the fragmental machines and the reason he does so is because he's, he's thinking about, he actually calls it, he's thinking about a, a moment in history when knowledge becomes, as Marx calls it, social knowledge. When, as he calls it, a general intellect emerges which all workers and all fat bosses draw upon. He doesn't imagine how they draw upon it. We know how they draw upon it via information networks. Marx says once you get social knowledge and private property, that, he says it, that is the explosive force which blows up capitalism. In other words, Uber, yeah, let's destroy it. Airbnb, let's destroy it. Let's destroy the rentier monopoly use of these networks to do that. My project is to create a wiki sector of the economy and first of all to recognise it. In 2013 the OECD published the first, remember we are 15 years into the post-broadband internet, 15, 17 years. So in 2013 the OECD publishes a major report, what is the value of the internet economy? And it answers, while the internet has had massive impact on the commercial sector, it has had an even bigger impact into a non-market sector. It is creating non-market effects. What does economics call non-market effects? Not economics. Economics for capitalism is the study of scarcity and markets. So in other words, economics cannot even conceive 
of Wikipedia being logical. In fact, to the uh, extreme neoliberal who believes in the Adam Smith uh, definition of homo economicus, economic man, every hour you or I spend on creating Wikipedia or a free software product or working for free in an urban farm is illogic. It's anti-human. Their definition of human is acquisitive, stab in the back, competitiveness, and we are behaving like uh, bees uh, instead of humans. But I believe the, the human, and as does Marx, that the fundamental almost definition of, of human beings is not acquisitiveness or competitiveness, but the desire to work, the desire to transform the environment around them. Nothing in that desire dictates that it must be done via the market. So I, I, I don't think that, that I don't think that information capitalism spontaneously moves beyond capitalism. It has to be pushed, it has to be attacked, it has to be reconfigured by state action. And in my book, the difference between me and what you might call the post-capitalist move movement or the peer-to-peer -peer movement is that their focus is the small-scale experiment Rather in the same way that um, Richard Arkwright, who'd constructed the first factory, his focus was on the machine and the factory process. It took a government to step in and say, we like this factory, let's clear agricultural land, let's destroy weaving, let's, dis let's um, uh, decriminalise the movement of labour between one town and another uh, in order that many factories can, can take place. This is my project to to construct a governmental intervention to promote the use of information technology to produce cheapness and abundance and more personal freedom for people. My favourite Marx story is when I think it's Wilhelm Liebknecht, the old one, or August Bebel, go one of the two, go to London to meet him in the 1850s, in the early period of the exile. When Marx met him, he said, look, the 48 revolution failed, but this is what Marx says, in uh, Crystal Palace, in this great industrial exhibition they had in, in the 1850s in Britain, there is an electric train, a train run on electricity, not steam. And Marx says something like, this is a reported comment, Marx never wrote this, Marx said, when trains go electric, then we'll get socialism. I like the technological determinist in Marx.